So here's the situation. It's the final round of day one, and so far, Prognananta and Ali Reza have been playing a match. It's a four-game match, and so far they've been trading wins. Prognananta won, Ali Reza won, Prognananta won. And now Ali Reza is in a must-win situation with the white pieces, and he decides to play pawn to e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop to b5. This is the Rosalimo Sicilian, which is obviously very popular at all levels of chess. But white here needs to play for a win, and what he comes up with is an absolutely fun and wild uh, double pawn gambit. So I knew I was going to make a video about this before I knew the result, okay? So I don't know the result. You don't know the result unless you watched it. And uh, we're just going to watch it no matter what happens, okay? Win, lose, draw, whatever the result is, we're going to be checking out this game because it was a fun one. And after pawn to g6, white decided to recapture immediately on the c6 square. And now, for the longest time, people were always recapturing here with this d pawn, but instead we saw b take c6, which is also what we saw in the video we recapped uh, between Fabiano Caruana and Gukesh, which was a very important game in the Olympiad that was just played. And in that game, uh, Fabiano did decide to play h3. Hopefully I didn't leak any results. Uh, but in that game, in this game, we saw castles instead of h3. But we saw bishop to g7, rook to e1, and now queen to c7, which is an interesting idea. And now after d3, we saw pawn to e5. And this is where we begin to see the gambit. And what is you going to do here as white? You're in a must win. Black has a very solid position. You have to do something a little bit radical in order to break down this position. And... White is, of course, ahead in uh, developments. Like, you got your stuff out, you got castled. So maybe you'd just be like, okay, maybe I should play c3 and d4. I think that would be, like, the logical way to try to break in the center. But maybe that wouldn't be enough. And instead we saw pawn to b4. White is instead going to attack from the flank and try to tear down the pawns on this diagonal. And black is very happy to accept the first pawn. And now we see this move pawn to a3. And if black wants to stay up a pawn, you're going to need to recapture. And that's exactly what happens. And so there goes one pawn. And now we can kind of see a little bit of the idea behind white's play. We're taking back with the bishop. We're on this long diagonal. We're going to try to make it impossible, at least at some point, for you to castle. But now you just play knight to e7 and if nothing else happens with black you play pawn to d6 you get castled you have no problems you're gonna be a pawn up so what is white gonna do you still have to find another way to create some pressure on this position and that's exactly what white does and white decides to play this move pawn to d4 where after you recapture instead of taking back right away we see this move Pawn to e5, making it difficult for black to ever play pawn to d6 and just get castled. Because um, you need to be able to keep this knight defended if you want to be able to castle on the king's side. So, pawn to e5. This is it. This is the cool idea that white had in mind. Now, black is also very clever and finds a way to shut out the bishop and plays this move pawn to c5, keeping this guy at bay. And now again, black is just threatening to get castled. So it's again white's turn to try to come up with a way to play energetically and to continue to try to uh, attack the center and chip away at it. And so we saw this move pawn to c3, just going directly after this guy. I would love to be able to snap him up. And obviously you might be able to take this thing or you might be able to push these are two major considerations available for black and in the game we saw pawn to d3 which is definitely the safest choice if you do decide to play the greedy option which is to take the pawn you then have to worry this knight's coming to c3 maybe we're hitting the queen and hopping in here and maybe even if you stop it maybe we'll find some way uh, to get this knight to a very aggressive square. So black is trying to play this as conservatively as possible. Black only needs a draw in order to win. Black plays pawn to d3. And of course you're sitting here, you're watching this, and you're like, all right. The next move is to just simply take this pawn. But white actually decides not to take the pawn right away and instead plays knight uh, to d2. And the point is this guy is hopping somewhere. There's a lot of different avenues. And maybe we can land that knight on the d6 square. So black uh, decides to play bishop to b7. And now we see knight to b3. The knight had a lot of different choices, but it goes to b3 where potentially it will be winning this pawn. And of course, we would love to try to goad this pawn forward. Um, just simply amplifying how strong this uh, this could possibly be and maybe here we'd be able to hop around and this is the kind of thing that even though black gets the super strong deep on uh, white is trying to accomplish in this position
in. So instead, we saw a very safe alternative. Black just decides to get castled. White is able to take one pawn back. And then after rook to e8, which you kind of need to get out of this pin here as black, white takes the other pawn back. And now after it's all been settled and done, black has just given back all of the material and been like, okay, take your two pawns back. I just want to get all my stuff out. And we get to this very interesting middle game. And potentially there's not enough here really going on for either side to try to play for a win, but maybe you can hope that we can maneuver around, we can play a million moves and maybe something will happen. But it's a very interesting position already because we can see just how many potential weaknesses there are in an end game like this. And black decides to play the move uh, knight to f5, which is a very active square for the knight opens up the e-file for the rook, and also very importantly, the knight is the one that's keeping control over this d6 square, which is a square that white is clearly intending on uh, occupying with something, probably the bishop. So if you want this knight to go away, because it is such a strong piece, you need to play this move, bond to g4, which is obviously a little bit risky, maybe not too much, but you are moving a pawn in front of your king, you gotta win, that's what you got to do. And now, if black wants to be able to keep this knight on a very active square, like uh, you could just go back and retreat, but that doesn't seem to help you too much because now the bishop is just simply entering in to the d6 square. If you want your knight to be able to continue to march over to the king side, you're going to need to remove this defender first, and that's exactly what we saw. Queen takes back, and now knight to h4 attacking the queen. So the queen moves over, and we see this... Uh, move actually first we see g5 protecting the knight of course and now after bishop to d6 we see this tricky move uh queen to b7 which is attacking this knight directly but it also has some ideas that you might be able to play knight to f3 and obviously this must be a little bit worrisome for white and i would think uh, a logical move here would just simply to be knight to d5, because that keeps control of the square, you save your knight, you're not allowing this. But white actually played a very accurate move here, uh, and one that requires a little bit of calculation. He played knight to c5, attacking the queen, and obviously this invites you, if you would like, to play this move knight to f3, where white would need to keep an, uh, on the same diagonal as this queen the only safe square to go to here would be king to h1 this is where you would have to go but you actually can survive this pin like it's obviously very scary but for the moment we have our eyes on your queen and if she goes somewhere we're going to be able to continue to find ways of attacking her like if she goes here we play rook to a6 this would be fine for white and if you were to go to this square for example we could play a move like pawn to c4 attacking the queen trying to remove the defender of the knight so black would need to be very careful so knight to f3 right away just doesn't quite work so instead we saw the queen goes to c6 where she's safe from the knight and now knight to e4 and maybe white is just about to start making some threats against black but again black very calmly calculated and came up with a tactical response we saw the move bishop takes e5 this is the way that black can simplify this game and now after this recapture you might be like wait what the heck uh you've just blundered a piece but no in fact black is able to now play this move and this was the tactic that black was hoping for black is hoping to liquidate simplify the game and you are not in time to take this rook due to this very important f3 square. And this is what happens when you move your jeep on. Your f3 square gets weaker, so this would just be a fork. Okay, so white obviously did not fall for that. And white instead played this move, knight takes g5, and simply removing a pawn. And now after this recapture, white is able to take this knight, uh, and here we go, we enter into this endgame, and it's kind of a funny endgame where black has all of these pawns are isolated, the maximum number of isolated pawns you can have, but, you know, also the A pawn is, <laughs> and it's a pass pawn, and also, like, every single rook endgame is a draw, right? Isn't that what they say? So here comes rook to g6, you gotta keep your rook protected, queen goes back to g3, and h5, which is actually a very aggressive, energetic way for black to play. This is actually the best move, maybe not the easiest move to play i don't know maybe he's really good maybe prognananda is like yeah this is the easiest way to do it but now after we keep this shut he plays pawn to h4 sacrificing this pawn knowing that he's going to be able to win one back so now we see this recapture the queen goes to c5 uh she's just trying to win back this g pawn 
And this is going to happen. We get to this position. Black issues a check first. The rook comes to e4. If you just move your king to the g1, okay, that's going to be... Or you just play f3 or play something else. It's probably just going to be a draw anyway. But this uh, leads to this position where we get pawn to f3. Black wants to make every trade available as possible. And you get to a position like this where, hey, wait a minute. Just for a second, it looks like white is actually up a pawn. We, we've liquidated everything. But no, black is uh, has calculated very well that he should be able to draw a position like this uh, because after some more moves, we can see white trying to keep pawns on for as long as possible. They get to an end game like this, where yes, white is up a pawn. Yes, the king is kind of stranded on the side of the board, but the problem really becomes black is going to continue to keep giving checks no matter what you do. And whenever the king crosses over this direction, which in order to make progress, that's gonna have to happen at some point, well, then the black king is simply going to be able uh, to get on the right side of this pawn here. So white tries for a little bit. You know that you have to win, but eventually he had to just give up and capitulate with a draw. So I thought that was a cool end game. And oh, hey, wait, wait, wait. We got some new technology here that I want to show you. The result of this game, wait for it. Bloop, bloop. Look at that. It was a draw. We got new anti-blocker technology. So tell me how you like it. Make sure you subscribe and I'll see you guys later. Bye.